all behaviors as well as health and, and illness occur in a biological context. Is that right? Yeah. In a biological context, health psychology draws attention to those aspects of our bodies that influence health and disease. Uh, our genetic makeup is one of these aspects. Our nervous system uh, uh, has to do with our health. Our immune system, how strong is our immune system, or how weak is our immune system. One of the problems we have as humans is autoimmune diseases. Autoimmune diseases are diseases where your body attacks itself. Now, why in the world would it do this? Well, one of the reasons is because your immune system is keyed, is keyed to take out things that are not good, that, that uh, are, are pathogens. And sometimes these are pathogens that occur in our own bodies, like cancers. Our immune system is keyed to destroy cancers. So sometimes our immune system attacks our own body. And this is what happens with rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, this is what happens with lupus erythematosus. This is what happens with asthma. Uh, a lot of times the uh, reaction that you're getting is, is, is a reaction not against something on the outside, it's something on the inside. Uh, there's an advertisement now for eosinophilic asthma. Eosinophilic asthma is where you, you produce so many uh, white cells to destroy your whatever the, uh, uh, the allergen is uh, that actually the eosinophils, the white cells that are being produced to, to attack the allergens, actually become part of the, the problem. And you can't get rid of your asthma because you have too many eosinophils in your lungs. So your immune system, in most cases, of course, it's, it's killing off all kinds of pathogens, but sometimes it can attack itself, and that's not a good thing. And, of course, our endocrine system, our endocrine system has to do with stress. It has to do with how you react to your environment. Uh, biological context, an example, the tendency to abuse alcohol is, is known to run in families, and we see this in different populations. We see whole families, um, grandma, uh, dad, and, uh, and their, their uh, grandkids, uh, they all have, uh, they're all alcoholics. Uh, why? Because they're more susceptible to alcohol. They react in a certain way to alcohol. It's genetic. Everybody reacts the same. We see this in the Irish population, we see this in the Polish population, uh, we'll see, see whole, whole family groups that, uh, that are drinkers, and, uh, and they're all alcoholics. They drink a lot of alcohol. Uh, if you watch select movies, you'll see you know, different groups of individuals having this problem, different family groups. Um, is, that, uh, is that true in the American Indian population? Do you see whole families of, of individuals? going back generations, and everybody's been an alcoholic in the family. They just can't tolerate alcohol. They, re they have a negative reaction to alcohol, and they can't stay away from it. Logically, I can say this because I don't have an addictive personality. My family doesn't have this problem. We don't, we're not addicted to anything. If anything, we're boring as hell. More boring than you can possibly imagine. <laughs> Or no fun, even a little bit. <laughs> it's easy for me to talk about this, but if I had this in my family, I'd, I'd try to stay away from this stuff. If I knew that if I ever took crystal meth that it was going to make me addicted to crystal meth, I wouldn't take it. I'd stay away from it. If everybody in my family smoked and they had to smoke and they felt like they needed to smoke and they couldn't stop smoking, then I would never start. That makes sense, doesn't it? <clears throat> Yes. So let's say if uh, one part of the child is adopted into a completely different family, they could still inherit that because of oh, yeah. genetics? It's there. Yeah. So they have to stay away from it for the rest of their lives. I have a nephew, and I keep talking about my great-great-nephew. Isn't he my great-great-nephew? He is. He's my great-great-nephew. Uh, his mom uh, used heroin during her pregnancy, and so this kid was born with a heroin addiction. And it took him six weeks to clean this kid up. Six weeks. And now he's fine, kind of, pretty much. 
doesn't seem to be, he's, he seems to stay up with, with all the other kids in his cohort. But because he was an addict, a heroin addict, when he was born, he has to stay away from everything. He can't smoke, he can't drink, he can't use any drugs for the rest of his life. Because he's already had an addiction. And this loop has already been created in his brain when, he was, when his brain was developing. So what's the probability this kid's going to be clean for the rest of his life? Isn't this fun? <laughs> and he's my great, great nephew. I can't wait to watch. Because his, mo his mother, the crazy bitch that wouldn't stop using heroin because she was pregnant, she didn't just use heroin. She got arrested for, for uh, pushing meth as cute as that is. She got arrested for, for pushing meth and when they realized, and the way she stayed out of jail was because she was pregnant. And, they, and the court ordered her uh, to, uh, she said, I, I, it's not my fault, I'm a, uh, I'm a heroin addict. And they said, we will, because you're pregnant, uh, we're going to take charge of you. And they ordered her, they, they told her, you have a choice, you can either go to prison or you, you have to sign a, a waiver allowing us to, uh, uh, to treat you. And she, so she did, of course. And they started giving her a synthetic uh, opiate that theoretically isn't nearly as addictive as, as heroin. So she took that stuff. And because she was a heroin addict, she also, took, she also shut up with heroin. Now, how stupid is that? She was already getting something that made her feel like she didn't like feel like she did when she took heroin, but instead of just doing that, she shot up with heroin at the same time. So if you look at pictures of her when she was pregnant, she looks she looks stoned all the time. Well, she is. She's, they're giving her stuff, and she and her boyfriend, who was a her pusher. Uh, was uh, was uh, giving her heroin at the same time. Because when he shot up, he wanted her to shoot up. You know, misery loves company. So she, she, he wanted her to do the same thing. So this kid was had the most god-awful heroin addiction you can imagine. And he can't, so for the rest of his life, <clears throat> he's got to stay away from this stuff. But that family... My brother's family, they, they don't control their kids even a little bit. They don't tell them no for anything. Whatever they do is the most brilliant thing and it's the most wonderful thing that ever happened. I heard she must have had the most wonderful heroin addiction in the world, the granddaughter. And now the nephew, of course. So will they try to keep him away from, it, from, from another addiction? The answer is probably no. Because they won't control their children. So he's... I, I, you might as well shoot him right now. My goodness gracious, that kid's a, he's, he's doomed. Because they won't control him. So he's doomed. Anyway, okay, so alcohol dependence is known to be partially genetic, though there is no single gene that controls the desire. I have no idea why her cigarette is, she's smoking, has a purple end to it. I have no idea why that is. Some people may inherit a great sensitivity to the pleasurable experience of experiences of intoxication and find the hangover minor. I told you last time about uh, uh, when I get drunk, I get depressed, and of course, and then I get a hangover, uh, I throw up, and then I get a hangover, so it's kind of like having the flu. I know, let's go get drunk and we'll pretend we have the flu. That, that sounds like fun. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> Maybe I'll shoot myself while I'm so depressed. <laughs> oh, boy. These people may be more likely to drink, of course, because they, uh, uh, they, they get more pleasure out of it. Uh, I had a student uh, who was from Romania, and I don't, this, not all Romanians have this, but this lady could drink as much alcohol as she wanted, she never got drunk. She could drink everybody under the table. She didn't have the same reaction to alcohol that everybody else does. She didn't have a hangover. She didn't get sick. She didn't get drunk. So, and I asked her one time, well, why in the world do you drink? And she says, well, everybody else is doing it. 
That's a reason. She says, I'd like to bet men that, that, that I could drink them under the table and I always win. Well, she does. She always wins. She doesn't have a reaction to alcohol. I told her, stay away from alcohol, you idiot. And I literally called her an idiot. Stay away from alcohol, you idiot, because alcohol is a toxin. And your body has to get rid of it somehow. And you're going to, despite the fact that you're not going to have any reaction to it, your body is still reacting to it. Inside, you're still reacting. Your liver still has to get rid of that stuff. You're going to give yourself cirrhosis of the liver. And I think I convinced her. Who knows? I know. How often do I call people an idiot? Uh, the, the, the complete set of genetic instructions that making a, make up a living organism is called a genome. Uh, there have been rapid advances in genomic uh, points to increase scientific evidence, supporting the benefits of using genetic tests and family history to improve health. If you watch television at all, uh, then uh, there, uh, there is uh, one uh, of these uh, genetic testings, uh, sites that talks about uh, you need to know who you, who you are so you can know where you're going. You know, they're talking about whether you have a proclivity for breast cancer or whatever so that you can do something about it, I guess. As strange as that may seem. Anyway, that's, that's what they're pushing now. Uh, can we go in and change your genes? The answer is no. It's against the law at this point, but potentially in the future. Uh, they Actually, the Brits are doing that now. Uh, if the Brits are doing it, you know the Canadians are going to start doing it. Uh, so this is something that, that, that potentially you're going to have to deal with. I'm never going to have to deal with it. I'm too old. I, uh, I won't have to worry about it. I think all my grandchildren are born. Damn it. I have a son that's 47 years old, he's got a uh, fiance that's 32, so she can still get pregnant, but I don't think he's going to do it. I don't think he's going to get her pregnant. I don't think I'm going to get another grandchild. I want one. I want two. <laughs> I'll take five. I don't care. I like babies. They're a lot of fun. See, that's, what my, that's the fun that my family has. That's how boring we are. We think babies are fun. <laughs> and you're right, we are boring. I can see it in your face, Chris. <laughs> ah, I got Chris's smile. It's just a little bit, but, oh, but it's still a smile. Uh, most important traits are, are, are what we call epigenetic. The genes are triggered to become expressed by environmental factors. It makes humans more adaptive. Uh, how many of you got cold this morning when you're walking outside is below zero? None of you did? Please. Come on. If you're outside too long, your face freezes, all right? Um, up north, of course, it's uh, up in uh, Fort Belknap. They're different Indians, of course. They live in that kind of environment all the time. They, they would find this weather just fun. They go out and play in this stuff. Of course, you can't do anything. You can't make snowmen when it's this cold. That doesn't work. But they, they, they think it's, it's a lot of fun. They never wear hats. I don't know what's wrong with those guys. They never wear hats. So their ears don't get cold. I haven't figured that one out yet. They have this goofy little hat that looks, I don't know, it looks like a baseball cap with a ball on top. And they all put this stupid hat on. It's got ear flaps, but they never pull, pull the ear flaps down. You guys have no clue. <laughs> what are you talking about? I don't understand. Uh, how many people walked out in the, in the, in the cold? I know you walked, walked up the stairs. Did, would, did you walk all the way from the parking lot? The yeah. parking lot's out here, of course, yeah. I guess. Yeah, no. <laughs> three steps. You three steps and you're inside. Okay. I know. <clears throat> I walked all the way from the fob. It's like a quarter of a mile. But it was okay because I've got a coat that... Does everybody have, anybody have a winter coat? Anybody? Anybody? You have one. Yeah, yours, yours is a winter coat. That's almost a winter coat. That's pretty good. That's not a bad coat. Joe, what are you wearing? That's it? Mm. No hat? No, of course not. How far did you walk today, Joe? Outside in the sub-zero weather? Half mile? Quarter mile? Three feet? Yeah, it's pretty far. Okay, yeah, I'm pretty tall. Uh, it gets real cold up in, my, in uh, Nebraska. I, that's where I raised my kids. When my, my son was in high school, 
we couldn't get him to wear a coat, and it's like minus 40 outside. Well, I don't know if you've ever been in that kind of weather, but everything freezes in about three minutes. And here's my son without. And he's skinny. He's got kids got no fat on him. He's he's a bodybuilder, so he's got like three percent body fat. And here he is out out wandering around in just a shirt and, and jeans and and gym shoes. He didn't even have winter boots on him. Ah, he's in Florida now. Um, some factors improve our health, nourishing food, a safe uh, place to grow up, education. Uh, all of this uh, is, is triggered by your, your genes. Your genes are triggered by what happens to you in your life. And it will change the structure of your, of your genes. Uh, some factors will compromise your health, environmental toxins, uh, potentially growing up here on the reservation. is kind of dangerous. Uh, there, there may be uranium in your water. Uh, who is it? Um, uh, Christine's husband won't drink the water here because he's he's afraid it's contaminated with uh, with uranium, and he won't let his babies he won't let his kids drink the water. So they only drink bottled water because he's afraid of the water. Sometimes the water's not good. Uh, when my wife was stationed in Korea, uh, they there's. Tubercula, there's a lot of diseases that are endemic to Korea. To, to Korea. And as uh, uh, Americans, people from our environment, when we go to Korea, we get sick unless we filter their water. But Koreans don't get sick because they're used to this stuff. Uh, but uh, we get sick. So when I, was, uh, when I visited my wife in Korea, um, uh, she, she had a container of water in her, in her refrigerator uh, they had filtered it so much that there was a layer of uh, charcoal at the bottom of her, of her container because there was so much charcoal in the water. Filtering, trying to filter out all the bad stuff. Um, I w went on a Fulbright trip to uh, South America. And when we're in Guatemala, we're one of the first groups to go into Guatemala after the Civil War ended. Uh, when we were in Guatemala, we all picked up a parasite. Well, they, if you live in Guatemala, you don't pick up this parasite. You don't, it doesn't even bother you. But because we were Americans, uh, and I was with an uh, American Indian group, it's not like it had to do with uh, our genes because we were inferior to their genes. Uh, a lot of them had the same genes. I mean, they were all indigenous peoples. Uh, we all picked up uh, this, uh, this parasite uh, that the Guatemalans don't pick up, but we did. It wasn't because I was white that I picked it up. It was because we, we weren't used to that. That is not part of our environment. And we didn't have a natural immunity to it. Uh, in the old days, if you went to Mexico, uh, you would get uh, uh, a form of diarrhea called that they referred to as Montezuma's Revenge. And all Americans would get it. It had to do with the lard that they were cooking their food in. They, they used lard to cook a lot of their food. Um, but uh, as Americans, of course, we're not used to that. Our epigenetics haven't been triggered in the right way to, uh, to protect us from that. So if you're in an environment where there's toxins, where there's poverty, poverty can change the way uh, that your genes will react, or child abuse, uh, potentially, of course, it will change your genes. It'll change your genetic structure. There are select regions uh, on the DNA that uh, are, GNA, uh, D are gene promoters that regulate the expression of the gene. And we'll talk about some of those. Um, during World War II, the Japanese decided that they were going to conquer the Pacific Rim. They were going to conquer the United States. They were going to conquer uh, Australia, New Zealand, all the South Pacific Islands, uh, all, all Indonesia, Malaysia, you know, the whole Pacific Rim. Uh, so they, they were going to go from Alaska, where it's really, really cold, up near the Arctic Circle, uh, to the equator, and then below the equator to Australia and New Zealand. Now Japan, I don't know if you know where Japan is, but it's right along the 45th parallel. Where between 45? Well, that's the 45th, up there in Hokkaido. So as you can see, uh, as you can see, uh, southern Japan is just like Arizona has the same environment. So they had people, they had all these Japanese people, all these Japanese soldiers, and they came from different places. Some of them came from up north, some, some of them came from down south closer to the equator. 
Well, the ones closer to the equator were okay down in uh, when they were fighting in New Guinea and, and in the South Pacific, in Guadalcanal and whatnot. They were fine. They had no problem. But the soldiers they took from up near uh, Hokkaido, up along the 45th parallel, those guys were used to cold weather. <clears throat> we were stationed in Masala, Japan. Masala, Japan is right, right here. That's Masala, Japan. We were stationed there. And uh, we were from, uh, we, were, we got there in August, and it started snowing in October. And from October until January, we got 100 inches of snow. 100 inches of snow. <coughs> Do you know how much snow that is? Can you imagine shoveling 100 inches of snow? Five, five yards. Yeah, five yards. <laughs> So, yeah, so if you're a yard tall, no, you're two yards tall. Okay, so that's two of you and, and then a half, a half again, five yards tall. That's, that's a lot. That was a lot of snow. And we got all that from until January. Uh, we left in January, and then it's, they had a blizzard. Uh, when they have blizzards up in, in uh, that part of Japan, uh, you can't see anything. You get, it's a completely, complete whiteout. They can't do anything during these these storms. You can't drive because you can't find the road. So you can't go anywhere. It's a complete whiteout. And so the Japanese, of course, they just stay in their, their homes. But it's cold. I mean, it's really cold. And I don't know if you've ever, if you understand, they don't have central heating in Japan. Uh, they'll heat the floor. That's what they do. They'll put a, a brazier under the, uh, they, they just heat the floor. They don't heat the, of course, heat rises, but it's not very, it's, it's pretty damn cold. It's real cold. So these guys are, are used to that type of weather. Well, when they try to take these uh, uh, soldiers from the north and send them into uh, the areas in the South Pacific uh, or along the, the equator in Indonesia and Malaysia, they die. They couldn't survive. And so they did experiments trying to figure out how they could change people so that they would be able to survive in any environment, and they couldn't do it. It all depended on where you were born as to what environment you were the most comfortable in. Now luckily, we live, we live in the United States, and in the United States it's fairly temperate. It's real cold up here, and it's real hot down here, but it's not that hot down there. So people from the north can go to the south without dying. We have a lot of people that move from, uh, from Chicago and Indiana. New York State, uh, New York City, they moved down to Florida to live for the rest of their lives. A lot of these individuals don't survive very long because they're not used to that type of environment. If you've ever been in Florida, it doesn't get real cold in the wintertime. It gets really hot and humid in the summertime. So they, they have a hard time surviving, it's as odd as that may seem. Anyway, they tried, so the Japanese did experiments during World War II trying to, to find out what was going on. And what they discovered was that you have, um, everybody has sweat glands. And the sweat glands are activated when you need to cool off. Well, if you live in the north where it's not that hot, then you don't develop as many sweat glands as people in the south. So potentially, those of you who are from Arizona and have lived in Phoenix rather than in the Four Corners area, uh, Phoenix is a lot hotter than it is up here. So potentially, you wouldn't be you wouldn't be able to go down to Phoenix and be very comfortable all year long. You'd probably live in air conditioning in the summertime because it's, it's different. And that's what the, the Japanese discovered. They tried, it to, uh, they tried to make people adapt, but they couldn't do that. It didn't work. So what they had to do was send their uh, northern soldiers, they had to, to keep them in temperate environments. And they sent the southern soldiers, the ones that were born in southern Japan, uh, to the... Uh, the areas that were hotter along the equator. Of course, as it turns out, I, you know, the, the uh, people uh, that, from this part of Japan, there's a lot more people that live in that part of Japan. So it's in the warmer section of Japan. It snows in, in all of it, all through Japan, as odd as that may seem. Uh, so how does how in the world do the genes uh, change? Uh, one way that they change is uh, a, a technique called methylation. DNA methylation is a biochemical process that occurs in cells and is essential to the health functioning of most body systems. 
Methylation helps regulate the expression of genes that repair your DNA, that control inflammation, and promote healthy blood vessels. This is really important. Methylation is extremely important. It, rep it repairs your DNA. If your uh, DNA uh, malfunctions, then what happens next? You age and you die. That's what old age is all about. Uh, controls inflammation. If you've ever been around uh, elderly individuals, a lot of times uh, things will start swelling up on them and they don't understand what's going on. Well, this is part of old age as well. Methylation is breaking down and of course they start having circulation problems. As interesting as all this is. So this has to do with aging. The breakdown in methylation promotes the uh, uh, development of cancers, diabetes, cardiovascular disease and it accelerates aging. If you've ever been around somebody and they seemed about the same age and they seemed about the same age and they seemed about the same age, then all of a sudden you haven't seen them for six months and then you go back and they're just all wrinkled up and they're old and all of their joints hurt. They just look old. All of, it's like they aged, they aged 15 years in six months. It has to do with methylation. Our genes last for only a select amount of time. All of us. When we're born, our genes are perfect. Everything is perfect. And everything's going to be perfect until you hit your expiration date. And at that point, there's not a whole lot you can do. You will age and die. Everybody dies. I'm sorry. Everybody dies. <laughs> Even me. <laughs> My wife doesn't like me. I, I think I told you this before. My wife doesn't like me because I don't age as fast as she does. And she doesn't like it. She doesn't like the fact that I can still move around. And she just had two, both of her hips replaced. That's my fault. <laughs> uh, I can still run. I, I, I look like this. This is what I look like. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Actually, I look like this, but it's not that old. I'm not as old as you. Yeah, our poor, poor old Arnold, uh, he's aging pretty quickly. Uh, how much longer will he last? I don't know. You know. It all has to do with your genes. It all has to do with what you did to yourself. Uh, there are things that you can do to, to accelerate aging. Uh, one of them is take steroids, which is potentially what poor old Arnold, Arnold did. Another one is to drink alcohol. Oh, here you go. Uh, poor diet, uh, tobacco use, exposure to environmental toxins, all of these things can accelerate aging. It can break down the methylation process, in which case aging is accelerated at that point. You can put toxins in your body that, will, that mean that you're not going to live as long as everybody else is. As your cohort group, <clears throat> I think I've told you this before, my plan is to outlive all of my cohorts. Everybody I graduated from high school with, I want to be the last, I want to bury the last one. I want to be the guy that buries the last person. So I've tried to live a healthy life. I've tried to eat the right foods, I've never done anything. I exercise, I, I, I try not to do anything that will hurt me, I don't take any drugs, I don't drink alcohol, I don't smoke cigarettes, which is potentially the worst thing you could possibly do, is to smoke tobacco. So where did we get tobacco? Who poisoned us with this horrible, horrible stuff? You guys did, damn it, what, what are you doing? You're trying to poison us all with your tobacco. It's your fault. So we got you back, we gave you alcohol. I know, it's another toxin. Blows your liver out. Wow. You gave us a toxin, we gave you a toxin, so everybody's pissed. <clears throat> okay, so the aging process. Of course, Arnold doesn't look like he used to. Obviously, he doesn't look like he used to. Uh, he could probably lift and he wouldn't look so bad, but uh, he looks pretty damn bad, doesn't he? Uh, he was Mr. Mr. Universe for like five years in a row. Life Course Perspective focuses on important age-related aspects of health and illness. Two-thirds of all deaths in the United States were caused by these five diseases. Heart disease is number one. Cancer is number two. Chronic uh, lower respiratory problems, CPD, uh, emphysema, uh, lung cancer um, is another problem. Stroke, of course. 
stroke, stroke, stroke. What is that? Blood clots? Can be. Could be a hemorrhage, could be a blood clot, could be an aneurysm causing a stroke. Uh, what causes blood clots in your body? Well, it can be caused naturally, but if you smoke cigarettes, are you excited about this? If you smoke tobacco, which makes you feel really good, if you smoke tobacco, it makes your platelets sticky. Really? Yeah, makes your platelets sticky. So you're more likely to have a stroke. So when my friend had a heart attack, what happened to him? He smoked all of his, almost all of his life. And he's younger than I am. And he just died of a heart attack last year. But he smoked. So when he had his heart attack, it killed him. When I had my heart attack, I don't smoke. I, haven't. I think I smoked a couple celebratory cigars when people had babies. Other than that, I've never, I don't really, I've never really seen it. tastes bad. Makes your, it gives you bad breath for like three days. I mean, well, who in the world would do this? It's like drinking. Drinking makes you depressed, you have the flu, and then you have, you're sick for two days. Well, this doesn't make any sense. Why would anybody do it? But people do it. They drink a lot of alcohol. Don't they? Some people, not everyone. I see it on television. They talk about it on commercials. People just down in beers. I think most of the age group I have put up with the they passed away with cirrhosis. Cirrhosis of the liver. You're not that old. Yeah. It's tragic. It is tragic. Yeah. We hear news from the clock. He or she passed away. And then it's always cirrhosis. Don't come sneaking in here, Mose. <laughs> <laughs> no, you did a good job. You snuck in really well. <laughs> We're talking about living forever. Good idea. <laughs> and then, of course, accidents are, the, are, are number five. But as you can see, heart disease is number one. And one of the reasons we have so much heart disease in the United States is because we eat crappy, stupid food. When I was growing up, we didn't know what good food was because they keep changing their minds. Oh, uh, bacon and eggs for breakfast, that's a good idea. As long as you have your orange juice, everything's fine. No, no, maybe not. Too much cholesterol. Oh, there's too much cholesterol in the eggs. It must be really bad. It must be really bad for you. No, no, it's the damn cholesterol in the bacon, idiots. It's, that's... That's pig fat, man. What are you? What are you doing? It's like it's like drinking lard. Who wants to do that? I mean, it's, it's good stuff. Anyway, so heart disease. Uh, heart disease is number one because of our. Not only that, but people smoke and people drink. And what does alcohol do when it when it hits your stomach? It turns into sugar, of course. It turns into sugar. Where's diabetes in here? I would say number two. No, it's not. Cancer's number. This is the general population of the United States. Number six? Yeah, average. However, if we take different populations, like this population, we'll take this population, where would diabetes be? You're right, it would be number two. In this population. But that's just this population. That's not everybody in the United States. <clears throat> so diabetes is a problem. And now we know that. Public health has told the federal government that this is a problem. And, that, and so we do all kinds of interesting things to help uh, people stay away from diabetes on the reservation mm -hmm. that we don't do in the general population. Mm -hmm. There's a problem in the general population. I mean, could we open up a diabetic center in Chicago? Why can we do that here and we can't do that in Chicago? I know, let's, let's open one up in, in Atlanta. We can't do that, can we? Why? Because their, their causes are probably not. Well, Diabetes it, probably falls. Well, it is. It's like, it's like six, seven, six or seven. It's, it's down here somewhere. Okay. Yeah. But why can't we do that in, in Chicago? I mean, we have people that do have diabetes. I mean, if it's, even if it's number seven, there are people with diabetes in Chicago. Why can we do that here and we can't do that there? Funding. It has to do with money. You're right. It has to do with money. But here, here of course, this is a, this is a, 
enclave population. This is a population unto itself. And not only that, you get free health care. You get IHS. So they can fund it through IHS. But if they're going to fund it in Chicago, who's going to fund it? And who is it for? See, here we can do that. We can, we can focus on your problems, the problems you have on the reservation. It's not the prob just the problem here on this reservation. It's on every reservation. You have diabetic centers everywhere. You've got them up north. You've got them in North Dakota. You've got them in South Dakota. You've got them in Washington State. You've got them in California. But we can do that because, of course, you've got IHS. You've got free health care. And so we can do that for you guys, but we can't do that for anybody else. African Americans have a really serious problem with, with high blood pressure. Can we go into a black community and set up a blood pressure clinic? No, who's going to fund it? I mean, where's the, what, where's the money going to come from? How are we going to fund it? So uh, you guys are kind of lucky and unlucky at the same time. All right, okay. You've got AHS, and because of that, we can, we can target your problems. But if we have another population, nobody else gets free health care, right? Who else gets free health care? Anybody? Does anybody else get free health care? Prisoners. I'm sorry? Prisoners. 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 There we go. So we can target the prisoners. Great idea. Fantastic idea. And we do. We kind of, well, we don't care if they die. Do we? So we now. We but what about African Americans? There, there is another uh, group that gets free health care, and that's people on Medicaid. Yeah. But that, see, that's a tough one, because when you were talking about Medicaid, who are we talking about? Elderly people. Elderly people, if they Our work low during low their low lives, low they get Medicare. Low income? Low income people, sure. So who's low income people in the United States? What race are these guys, are these people that are low income? Not, well, it's every race. The, most of the people that are poor are white. Really? <laughs> yes. There are more poor white people in the United States than there are of everybody else put together. So when we target poor people, we can't target a specific group like that. Because it's everybody. You know, okay. Right. So you guys are like kind of in an odd, horrible healthcare sort of way. Uh, the psychological context, health psychology supports the idea that health and illness are subject to, to uh, psychological influences. The way that we appraise a situation can dictate our reaction to it. Events that are, that are appraised as overwhelming, pervasive, or beyond our control will take a greater toll on us, both physically and psychologically. So if we can't control the situation, that is when our stress increases. When you are a lower ranking military individual and you are told to do something, you cannot argue. You have to do it. That's very stressful. But if you're a sergeant, if you're an NCO or you're an officer, then you actually get to make decisions. And those people aren't as stressed as the individuals that are lower ranking. And this is one of the things we discovered from Vietnam. In Vietnam, we drafted a lot of people. Those guys were only in the military for two years. They had uh, six months of training, then we sent them into combat. They were very low-ranking individuals. They were the lowest-ranking individuals. They were in combat for a year. Then they came out of the service. We tried to clean them up for about six months, and then we kicked them out. And these are the individuals that suffer more from PTSD than anybody else. The individuals that had been in the army prior to combat, the individuals that had been that were in the army after combat for an extended length of time, these individuals didn't suffer from PTSD nearly as readily as the individuals that we just snatched off the street, trained them for six months, sent them into combat, and then tried to clean them up for six months and kicked them out. Those guys are the ones that suffered from PTSD. They were the worst ones. The NCOs, the officers, not so much. They didn't have, they didn't have the same problems. Uh, they didn't start to have PTSD until later on in life. The uh, individuals that were draftees that uh, we took into the military had no rank, always had to do what they were told. 
these individuals had PTSD coming out of the service. But the rest of the, the, the NCOs, the officers, they didn't have PTSD until later on, later on in life. Anyway, so the more control you have over things, the less likely that you will have PTSD. Some research indicates that whether a stressful event is actually experienced or merely imagined, the body's stress response is nearly the same. So you don't even have to be in combat. Uh, people that were just in Vietnam, people that were in Saigon and, and uh, dressed in really nice clothes and got to wear starched uniforms every day. Even those guys came back with PTSD. All you had to do was imagine it. If you went outside uh, in Saigon, there's always a possibility that you were going to be bombed or you were going to be shot. When I was when I was there, um, I was a medic, and we were mostly at uh, Tan Sanut Air Force Base, which was probably the most protected place in the world at that time. But we were hit by a rocket attack, and and guess where it hit? It hit the uh, medic's door. The other end. Thank God it was the other end. <laughs> Killed 56 people. Really serious problem because. All of a sudden, we lost 56 medics. They were nurses, uh, they were uh, technicians. Uh, we had to replace all those people almost right away. So we had to bring, we had to bring almost 100 people over from the States uh, almost right away. And of course, it takes time to cut all those orders and whatnot. So the rest of us were, were working double time. We were working our tails off trying to make up for the people that had been killed. Depression may be partially due to replaying stressful events over and over in your mind until the stress becomes oppressive. I've never had problems with this. I'm lucky. I forget stuff. I don't ruminate on things. Things don't bother me like they bother other people. Dr. Wolf keeps coming into my office and saying, look at this, this should bother you. And I'm sitting there going, no it doesn't. That I don't have the same ideas that you have. Go to page four. Page four. It'll, it'll upset you. Page four doesn't upset. Sorry. Some stuff just rolls right off my back. I'm sorry. Things don't upset me that upset her. <clears throat> what does upset me is uh, if I bother you guys. If, if I hurt you guys, I would never want to hurt anybody. That's, I'm a medic. I don't, want to, I don't want to ever hurt anybody. I want to help people. I'm a psychologist. I don't want to make you feel bad. I want to make you feel good. So if I didn't, if I bothered somebody, then that would bother me. That would bother me. <clears throat> but I don't get depressed. Sorry. I know, except when I drink. I know, I won't drink. <laughs> it works. Francis and I were talking about positive psychology yesterday. Positive psychology teaches the concept of subjective well-being. It focuses on feelings of happiness and a sense of satisfaction with life, trying to see the, the positive in everything. This is not the idea that you ignore stress and negative things, but that you reflect on the positive in any such a situation. This is not, a, this is not a, an easy situation for me. I love you guys. I love you guys. Love all my students. Hate the administration, love my students. <laughs> Sorry. <me? laughs> Except for you. Devin, you're my favorite. Uh, but this is really tough. Uh, for one thing, I'm around people that aren't like me. I don't know if you noticed that or not, but you guys are Navajo and I ain't. I don't know. I know, I know. It's a shock to me, too. Dang, I didn't know that. Yeah, thank you for letting us know. In most situations, people don't like to be around people that aren't like them. You, most people don't. It doesn't bother me because uh, I'm polluted or something. That's not, but that's not the only problem. The, the other problem is my wife's up in Iowa taking care of my grandson. So I'm lonely. I'm lonely a lot. So it's tough. But I try not to think about those things. I try to be as positive as I possibly can. Don't they seem happy to you guys? 
Well, maybe it's because I pick up, I'm going to pick up my wife tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> from the airport. You know what? Of course. <laughs> so this is a this is a tough gig. It really is tough. Uh, I've got to be by myself. Uh, I've got the do dogs. The, you know, they're Navajo dogs. They run How do you know? <laughs> because this is where I got them. I got them right here. Do they still run out? No, I got them locked up now. I can't. They can't get away. But they are good dogs. Francis is taking care of them. They're they're sweet dogs. But uh, yeah. it, it's this is tough. This is really tough. Well, I try to make it as positive as possible. I love coming to class. I really love coming to class because you guys make me smile. Uh, this is not me. Okay. Okay. Attitude. <laughs> Attitude in any medical situation will have an impact on the outcome of the situation. A patient who feels that they will have pain from a surgery or side effects from a drug is more likely to interpret minor problems as precursors to all their fears. Uh, this is a trick that I use when I go to the dentist. I have really sh 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 bad teeth. <laughs> and I have a lot of dental work done. Over the holiday, I had to go to the dentist twice. <laughs> well, three times. Oh, man. <clears throat> Uh, Novocaine doesn't, well, you know that opiates don't work on me very well. Well, Novocaine doesn't work very well either. So in order for them to deaden my teeth, this last time, he had to give me three shots in the same spot. I know. And he digs around and digs around, tries to find, oh, God, what a mess. But I would rather go to the dentist than I would to go to the barber. Isn't that strange? Barber doesn't hurt you. The dentist always does. But what I try to tell myself is, eh, I don't care. <laughs> so when he, when he sticks that needle in my jaw and digs around for the, uh, and he is digging, he's, he's messing. I know, hurts just thinking about it, doesn't it? <laughs> I try to relax. It only hurts for a second anyway, usually. Except he shot me three times in my right jaw, and now it's sore, and it's been sore for like three weeks. So I can't open my mouth very wide because he, he hit me so hard. It's like he punched me in the jaw. Anyway, if you can, uh, if you can think positive thoughts about what's going to happen, then, uh, then you're okay. Uh, I had a uh, heart stent put in, I don't know, about three years ago. And, uh, you know, it just, I, I just didn't worry about it. I knew it wasn't going to hurt. It actually did, but it, I woke up during the surgery. Dumb shits. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> well, they sh they're supposed to knock you out and keep you knocked out during the whole surgery. But I started waking up and he didn't hit me right away. You know, he's supposed to shoot another bolus of fentanyl into me. The tension will make the negative outcome more likely to happen. And of course, that's the kind of stuff that happens. Watching a movie last night, uh, this uh, officer is leading his men. This is in, in, uh, during World War II. He's leading his men, and, and all of his men get killed. Well, not all of them get killed, but, but a lot of his men get killed. So he blames himself for all of these men dying. Well, he gets wounded during the battle, and they take him to the hospital, and they fix him up, and he's not healing. And he wasn't healing because he felt guilty for all of his men die for, for his men dying. He felt responsible. So he wanted to die so that he would be one of the individuals that So he it's almost like payback. So then they so he's got this bum leg and he's supposed to go to Repo Depot and okay, they're gonna ship him out of combat. But instead of doing that, of course, he goes back into combat, breaks, breaks the, he goes against his orders, goes back into combat, and of course he gets, <laughs> doesn't get killed. But uh, he proves to himself that he's brave enough to, to lead his men and, and he'll do it the way he has to do it. A lot of times if you're an officer, of course, you have to, you have to tell your men to go do something that will get them killed. Okay, and that's just the way war works. But you have to do whatever you can do to keep them as safe as possible, to save as many men as possible. And that's not what he did the first time, but that's what he did the second time. So then he felt, he felt fine. And he married the, 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 the nurse, 
and everybody lived happily ever after, even though he, he gave a lot. Like that. <clears throat> okay. But he was proud of his, his limp. <laughs> so tension has to do a, a lot with, uh, with how you recover. Uh, your attitude going into uh, going to the doctor, your attitude uh, going into the dentist. Uh, I mean, it can change the it can change everything. If you're relaxed, then then you're more likely to have a positive outcome. If you're all tense, then you're more likely to have a negative outcome. Anytime you're you're in that kind of a situation, psychological interventions can help patients learn to manage their tension. Patients who are more relaxed are better, are better able to follow their doctor's instructions. Negative life events have been linked to decreased immune functioning and thus increased susceptibility to illness. I know, this is like, a, this is like an avalanche. This is like a cascade. So you've got these negative attitudes. You go see the doctor, negative things happen, and then all of a sudden your immune system gets weaker. And since your immune system is weaker, now, neg now you have more negative outcomes. If you had relaxed in the beginning, then potentially you wouldn't have all of these negative outcomes. And it turns out that it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse and worse until you die. Bye. See you later. Maybe if we go to the same place. <laughs> Maybe not. I'm an atheist, so I'm not going to go to heaven because I don't believe in heaven. So, God, I don't know where the hell I'm going. Or hell. I, I don't believe in hell either. So I'm, I'll probably, I don't know what, what's going to happen. I guess I'll just get cold. I think I'm going to be cremated. So I'm not worried about it. And I shouldn't be laughing about death. Oh. Sure I can. I'm, I'm, it doesn't matter to me. Social contexts are the ways that we think about influence, about influence and relate to one another and the environment, social context. We're influenced by our birth cohort, and this is what uh, Francis was just talking about. He was talking about all the people that he was raised with, all those other kids that, that he went to high school with. Uh, the people that he, potentially it's the people that you went to college with. Well, you went to college later, so your cohort's a little bit different. Uh, I went to high school with a select group of individuals. Uh, about a third of them were dead. And the, the third that are dead are mostly people that either committed suicide or smoked. And those people are dead. They've had heart attacks, they've had strokes. Herbert. Anyway, those people are dead. It's about a third of my class, and they're all the, all the people that smoked. All the people that did negative things, they're all dead. The people that I went to college with, smarter people, about a third of them are dead. Where did they go? What happened to them? One well, of the ones that smoked. And the ones were, that were in really stressful jobs. As it turned out, the ones that took jobs that, where they made a lot of money but they didn't like those jobs. I went to an elite school with a lot of rich kids. And a lot, a lot of times the rich kids will do whatever their parents want them to do. They want them to be a lawyer. They want them to be a doctor. So they will send them to college to be a lawyer or a doctor. And of course if they don't become a lawyer or a doctor, their, parent, their family is mad at them. Their, their fathers and their mothers are pissed off at them. Well, that didn't happen because all these kids were really smart, so they thought they could do anything that they wanted. And so some of them became doctors and they didn't like medicine. Some of them became lawyers and they didn't like being lawyers. And they died. They, were, they had to work every day. And the reason they had to work every day is because they didn't enjoy doing what they did. But I was lucky. I got to do... I only, I've only done things that I enjoyed. <laughs> But then again, I enjoy working, so it's not work to me, it's fun. This isn't a job to me. This is just a blast. I'm having a great time. I know. This is nuts. I'm crazy. This is wacko stuff. If you work at something that you enjoy, it's not work. You don't struggle with it. You don't have to force yourself to do stuff. I enjoy talking to you guys. I love this stuff. I'm having a great time. 
I know. It's like therapy for me. <laughs> Everybody else is, I'm 70 years old. I should be dead. All my cohorts are dead. They're all gone. Well, they're not all. <clears throat> anyway, if you enjoy the work that you do, then you're going to live for an extended length of time. Group, the, the, your cohort, of course, is the group of people that you're born with, the people that you're, you're raised with. It has to do with your histor the historical people that you are around. So it's the people that I went to war with. It's the people that I went to basic training with. Uh, it's people that I went to college with. It's people that I went to high school with. Uh, who else? It's people I married. <laughs> I, I haven't been married that, that I've only been married three times. That's not that many times. Sociocultural perspective is a theoretical perspective that focuses on how social and cultural factors contribute to health and disease. Culture is the enduring behaviors, values, and customs that a group of people transmit from one generation to the next. Your culture is extremely strong. Uh, I've complained about this a lot. Uh, not that your, your culture is so strong, but the fact that I come from a culture that I'm not exactly sure what the hell it is. I don't know. I'm not exactly sure. I'm white. Is, that, is there a white culture? Kind of. I'm from Indiana. Is that a culture? Yeah, kind of. Has something to do with basketball. Um, I'm, I was raised on a farm. Is that a culture? Yeah, kind of. I know how to drive a tractor. I can dig a hole. It doesn't bother me to work. I I I it doesn't bother me to sweat. Maybe that's part of my culture. I was in the military. That's, that's a huge culture. That's a massive culture. One of the things that happens in basic training is they take the individual right out of you. They bust it, they bust it right out of you, and then they, they, they raise you up as a group, as being part of the group. That's what happens in basic training. Of course, this was during Vietnam, too. So they had to teach you to be one of the group really, really fast. Because we were going to war, and we knew we were going to war. So they had to do that really, really fast. They did it in about six weeks, which is tough. I know, your basic training was a lot longer than ours was. I know. But they were pumping people in and out, <clears throat> out of the, well. Uh, luckily, and I'm smart this way, I knew that if I joined the Army, I'd get shot. Somebody's going to blow my brains out. I knew that that was going to happen. All my brothers were in the Army. So I joined the Air Force. This is how smart I am. This is in 1971, I joined the Air Force. Because the Air Force was a safer branch of the service. And they hardly ever shoot Air Force personnel. Hardly ever. It, never, it doesn't never happen, but it hardly ever happens. Well, this is how smart I am. Yeah, I know. So wait a minute, wait a minute, it gets better. So I'm in, I'm in basic training, and guess where all of my people went? Almost everybody from my basic training unit went into the the, the military police. They went into the ESPs, the security police in the Air Force. There's two different branches of it. Almost everybody went into the security police. Well, this doesn't make any sense. Why in the world would they make us all cops? Because we were starting an air war. They were going to pull out of the land war in Vietnam, and they were going to start an air war. This is linebacker two, linebacker one, linebacker two. I mean, there was a bunch of them. Uh, so they were sending us all to Thailand and to Vietnam to man the, uh, the airfields. In Tha there were three airfields in Thailand, and there was, there's one in uh, Vietnam, Tan Sanu, and then there was one in Guam, so we could have been sent to Guam or Thailand. My first, my first orders were to Thailand. See, that's how smart I am. <laughs> If I had known what was going on, I would have joined the Army, because they were pulling people out of Vietnam and the Army. But no, I joined the Air Force. And, uh, <clears throat> sometimes you make a mistake. So culture. Culture is a question. You guys have a, a very definite culture. You're, uh, you've got your own language. It's, it's a culture unto yourselves. Uh, my culture is a little bit more circumspect. I'm not exactly sure what it is. Ethnic group is a large uh, group of people who tend to have similar values and experiences because they share certain characteristics. Religion has something to do with your, with your, uh, uh, so it's, well, it has to do with all of this stuff. 
So if you're a Presbyterian, my wife's a Presbyterian, wherever she goes, she just finds the, a group of Presbyterians and she's got friends. Well, I don't have a religion, so I don't have any friends. It's not sad. I mean, if I were Catholic, I could go to the Catholic Church and I'd have all those Catholic friends. If I were Mormon, I could go to the Mormon Church and I'd have all those Mormon friends. But I ain't nothing. <clears throat> and this is a tragedy, if you think about it. Yeah, okay. And so I'm not exactly sure what my culture is. Socioeconomic status is a measure of several variables, including your income, your education, and your occupation. And of course, my socioeconomic status is fairly high because I am a college professor. They just named me college professor here. Uh, I have a lot of education, more than practically everyone. When I was in the service, I had more education than anyone. When I was in the service, I had four degrees. Well, even the guys with PhDs only had three. I had four. Now I have five. Who, who does that? Only somebody that's been in the military that gets their education for free. <laughs> gender perspective uh, is a theoretical perspective that focuses on gender-specific health problems and barriers to health uh, to healthcare. One problem that women have faced in the past is underrepresentation of women as participants in medical research trials. It's not going. It's not happening anymore. But in the past. Uh, when they when they did research, they did research on men. Uh, so when the Air Force did all their research looking at cholesterol, they there they weren't any female pilots. They were looking at pilots. They were trying to keep those airplanes up in the air, not because they wanted to save those guys' lives, but because they didn't want them to crash their airplanes. Because airplanes are expensive. Men are dime a dozen. Not even a dime, a nickel a dozen. I know we're cheap. And they'd kill us off for nothing. They didn't care, as long as we didn't crash the airplane. You think I'm kidding. <laughs> I wish I were. <clears throat> Women are more likely to have reproductive system problems than men are. Men rarely, well, this is not, this is not completely true. Men have problems with their prostates. As you get older, Men aren't supposed to live into their 70s and 80s. So this is one of the reasons why they keep talking about prostate problems. And they don't have time. Uh, this is why they keep talking about prostate problems. As you get older, this is something that can happen to you. Especially if you, uh, there are ways that you can protect your prostate. One of them is not to get any, not to get gonorrhea or chlamydia. So how do you do that? How do you not get, look, gonorrhea or chlamydia. Well, you don't have sex with the wrong people. No, you do have, no, wait a You don't have sex with the wrong people. That's not how you do it. Okay. <laughs> but women have all kinds of interesting problems. Your reproductive system is the whole reason that you, that we as humans, this is the only reason that we're alive. We are animals, and animals, are the only reason you're there is to reproduce. I, I hate to say that, but that's the truth of the matter. There are animals that are born without mouths and without digestive systems because all they do is reproduce. They only live for 24 hours. And their whole job in life is to reproduce. <laughs> they live for 24 hours. What kind of a life is that? Well, they have a good time while they're alive. <laughs> and then they die. Uh, lace wings are that way. What's another animal? Uh, there's most of them are insects. I don't think I can't. Some lizards are that way. They only reproduce. They don't have mouths. Uh, women are more more likely to be malnourished than men. You need more nutrients than we do. Females need more nutrients than we do. But then again, men need uh, they need more protein for muscle mass because men are supposed to be big and strong. Other than those two problems, men are more vulnerable to nearly every other health problem. We have more lung disease, we have more heart disease, we have more strokes, we have more diabetes, we have more everything. We have higher blood pressure than women do. Women are protected by their estrogen. Estrogen protects you from just about everything. Until you go through menopause. Until your estrogen level goes down, then all bets are off. You're just like... You're just like males after that. Sorry about that. Uh, you can start, you lose your breast tissue, 
and your hips, which normally have that, uh, your hips are, are narrow, narrower, all of a sudden they become the same size as the rest of the body. So even your, your looks are even the same, as strange as that may seem. Uh, but men, probably by this time, they've already died of heart disease or, or whatever. Or they were playing football and they got hit in the head and, and it killed them or whatever. They got a TBI and they died. Men are stupid. We're going to talk about how stupid they are in just a second. By the age of 80, women outnumber men by two to one. Which doesn't sound, I don't know, maybe, maybe men are just a pain in the ass and you can't wait until they're almost all gone. <laughs> So you don't have to put up with them anymore. <laughs> Men are more likely to make unhealthy food choices. They're pretty damn stupid about it. Uh, they're more likely to be overweight. They exceed guidelines for alcohol consumption and enjoy and engage in binge drinking where they drink a lot all at one time, which is the dumbest way to, to drink. They ignore illnesses, uh, illness symptoms and they avoid seeing a doctor. You've got to hit them over the head with a hammer in order to get them to go to the doctor. They think it's macho not to go to the doctor. So they've got a... We had this guy up, this is up in Montana, and he, this guy was a, a, a rancher, and he was working on, he was uh, cutting hay. Uh, and uh, the hay rake came down on his leg and punched a hole in his leg. I know, it went all the way through. Uh, it was an in and out. It didn't stick in there and stay in there. Uh, so, so he's bleeding like a stuck pig. So he decides that he's going to go, he's got to finish the field, right? That's how smart the guy is. He's got to go finish the field. So he sits down in the creek, to, uh, and it's a cold creek. It's cold water, right? Of course, he's got cows urinating and, and defecating in the, in the, uh, in the creek down, downstream. So he goes and he lays down in the creek to stop the bleeding, and it does, it slows it down. And so then he gets in, back in his uh, hay rake and he, and he finishes the, uh, uh, the field. And then he goes, he drives, to, he drives home and he gets his wife to drive him to the doctor. So he comes in and his pants are soaked with blood. Of course they're soaked with blood. He was bleeding like a stuck. But anyway, that's how stupid men are. This is how dumb this guy is. He had to finish his field before he could go to the doctor. He got an infection in his leg because he laid down in the creek to stop the bleeding. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. It's just the dumbest thing in the whole wide world. And this happens over and over and over and over again. To get a man to go to the doctor, you almost have to knock him out and drag him to the doctor. As stupid as that is. Engage in risky competitive sports where there's a high rate of injury. Has anybody ever been hurt in a basketball or football or soccer game? I lost my spleen in a soccer game. I lost my spleen in a soccer game. I lost my knee in a softball game. <clears throat> I, I, I'm missing pieces because of, because of sports, as sad as that is. I have a missing muscle out of my right leg. My adductor longus, it's the one that goes from your groin to your knee, it holds your legs in. I'm missing that piece of muscle. I lost it in a football game. This is how stupid I am. I don't want you guys to think I'm smart. <laughs> I've got pieces missing because of sports, okay? I know. The soccer game, I was taken out by a, a, a friend of mine. He took me out. He, 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 he broke his shoulder. I know he broke his shoulder. He ruptured my spleen. He hit me so hard, he ruptured my spleen and broke his shoulder. And he's a friend of mine. I know. This is what sports are all about, right? He was a Brit. I know, there's something wrong with this. And the guy that took out my knee, Canadian. I know. Don't. Don't tell me how nice those damn Canadians are. I'm missing a knee because of them. <laughs> uh, men are at greater risk for nearly all the major diseases that affect both, both sexes. This is a point of fact. So there's a problem with men, and of course women are stronger than men are. Not physically, of course, but uh, they live longer. Well, obviously they live longer. If two out of every 
uh, three people uh, over 80 are female. Men go off to war and get killed. And they volunteer to be in combat. They volunteer to be the ones to get shot at. This is how dumb they are. You know? They join organizations that, that their, their motto is first to die. Who wants to join that group? Who does that? Well, men do it, of course, because they're macho. That's, that's their problem. Anyway, although low income uh, eat socioeconomic status usually predicts poor health, uh, this, is one, one, this is not true for Hispanics. Whew. Okay, let me say that again. Although low socioeconomic status usually predicts poor health, this is not true for Hispanics and other ethnic groups in the United States. They have lower rates of heart disease, cancer, and stroke. However, after two generations, Hispanics are just as likely to have typical American problems such as obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. The people coming across the border, first and second generation uh, Hispanics, are healthier than anybody else in the United States. They're healthier than American Indians, they're healthier than white people, they're healthier than Asians, they're healthier than, healthier than African Americans. This is one of the reasons why. And the people that live the longest are, are Hispanic females. They have the longest life expectancy in the United States up until they've been here for more than three, two generations. So if they've been here for a hundred years and they're just like everybody else. Fat as toads. So Hispanics, Hispanics have the highest life expectancy in the United States. And Hispanic females are number one. This is one of the reasons why I said I wanted to be a Hispanic female. <clears throat> so I can live so I can live a really long time. But I'll have to learn Spanish and have to get those shots, so I'm not exactly sure if I want to do it. <laughs> what do health psychologists do? Health psychologists become teachers, they, come, they become research scientists, they become clinicians. Uh, positive psychology is a new focus on optimal, healthy uh, human fact functioning. This is a new direction in psychology. It's only been around for about 15 years, uh, positive psychology. Uh, when I was teaching at Ashford, two of us were, were positive psychologists. One of us was a cognitive psychologist. Kind of a grouchy guy, too, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> Clinical health psychologists are licensed practitioners who focus on health promoting interventions. And so, what, uh, where do health psychologists work? Uh, most of them work in independent practice, 22% uh, of them work in education. 12% work in hospitals, 10% uh, in other human service uh, areas, 7% in business, and 3% in some other field. Most of them are in independent practice, health psychologists. Not a bad thing to get into. It's a lot of fun, especially if you practice uh, positive psychology. You try to change people's attitudes about, about their health. Um, your genes aren't locked in. We know that. We know that there's epigenetics. And you can change your life. If you change your lifestyle, a lot of times you can change your health trajectory. We, we do this with people that smoke cigarettes. We do this with people that drink alcohol. We can, if we can clean them up, or people that are drug addicts. Now here's the, here's the reality. I'm going to tell you something true that, that um, usually they don't even talk about. And the reason they don't talk about it is because they want, they want you to change. The reality is that if you drink alcohol, you have taken select years off your life and there's no way to get those back. I apologize. not my fault. If you were drunk at some point, point in your life, if, you were, if um, uh, your DNA told you that you should live to be 100, you're only going to live to be 80 now. If you put those toxins in your body and you stress your body out you, and you change things in your body, then you're not going to live as long as you're supposed to live. I, it's not my fault. If you smoke tobacco, it's worse. Tobacco, you know, after 10 years, your body goes back to exactly where it was before you started smoking. However, the damage that you've done to your body is still there, and it will stay there. 
and you will die younger. So if you put those toxins in your system, you're going to die younger than you should have. If you take drugs, crystal meth is the worst. Crystal meth accelerates your life. You're not going to live as long as you could have lived. I apologize. It's not my fault. We're seeing this happen with, the, with all the rockers. Francis is a, uh, uh, a fan of uh, 70s and 80s rock. They're almost all dead. David Bowie <laughs> died of old age. Uh, the guy from Wham, George Michael, dead. Uh, Richard Pett, not Richard Petty, that's the oh, race car driver. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Petty, Tom Petty's dead. He died younger than he's, he, he overdosed. So I, there's a lot of people that died. There are a lot of people that died at 27. Yeah. Jimi Hendrix, uh, who's the chick? Uh, Janis Joplin. These are all people that died in their 20s. They overdosed. If you do these things, if you don't, if it doesn't kill you right away, it's still going to cut your life. It's going to limit your life, and, and it's not my fault. I wish I could say that you're going to you're going to live as long as you would have lived anyway. I'm in I'm in the same situation. I don't have a spleen. I should be dead already, but I'm not. But that should that it's part of my. Is it time to go? Oh, I it's time to go. If Joe leaves, we all have to go. And it's not my fault. I apologize. But that's just the way it is.